Hello, and welcome to the lecture for Chapter 12 from, from Conceptual Physical Science, 6th edition. So with the first 11 chapters behind us, we really have covered what is traditionally physics, the study of pure physics. Now we're getting into chemistry. However, chapters 12 and 13 are very much a bridge between physics and chemistry, because to be honest, there is a lot of crossover. What do I mean by that? We'll talk a bit more when we talk about chemistry, certainly in chapter 14, when we talk about the so-called elements of chemistry. But chemistry is a study about how atoms hold together and form molecules and how those molecules interact with other molecules. It's very interested in the electrons around the atomic nucleus, which we in fact will be talking about this week. So, and it is, there's a lot of crossover because some of the things that we'll talk about in this chapter on atoms and the periodic table will be well within the bounds of physics. We'll touch a little bit on quantum physics, a topic that doesn't get covered too much in this book, but gets touched on in this very chapter. So with that out of the way and kind of some perspective, let's go ahead and take a look at our table of contents for this lecture, okay? so. We'll talk a little bit about atoms and how they are ancient and empty, just to set the stage, because maybe you don't think about atoms as being ancient and empty. Indeed, they are. Then we're going to get into the periodic table, the elements themselves, okay? Very much a good map for so much of the discussion that we do when we talk about atoms, okay? Then we'll talk about protons and neutrons, which are within the atomic nucleus. We'll return to, in more detail, to the idea of the periodic table. Then We'll talk about periods and groups, which are just ways to break up the periodic table to make it a little bit more digestible and easy to understand. Then we'll talk about briefly the difference between a physical and conceptual model because it kind of fits well into this chapter. Then we'll talk about a technique that scientists use for identifying particular atoms using something called a spectroscope, which is very much a physics idea. And then we'll get into the quantum hypothesis, which is the basis for quantum physics. And you might not even know what that word means, quantum, and that's fine. I want to very much define that word and make sure we can walk away from this lecture and this lecture video being like, okay, I know what a quantum is. Then we'll talk about electron waves, which is one of the consequences of the quantum hypothesis. And then finally finish off with the shell model as a way to conceptualize the atom. Okay, well, we should get to it. Okay, so atoms. Right. The now, what are atoms? You know, we'll talk about that a lot, and it, it's an important question. You might be saying, "Well, we can't jump ahead and, and talk about atoms without defining what they are." Well, they're the building blocks of matter. Let's just say that they're the they're the smallest chunk of unique types of matter. Okay, and they are ancient. You know what I mean by that is the origin of most atoms goes back to the birth of the universe. Okay, not within the first second of the universe, but as the universe cooled, atoms were able to be formed, which took a few thousand years. And as those atoms were formed, different ones were produced. Now, what's interesting is the atoms that were produced were only hydrogen and helium in those first few hundred thousand years of the primordial universe. We're talking the Big Bang here. And we'll return to the study of the Big Bang at the very end of this book when we talk about astronomy. But not to get ahead of ourselves or go off top topic here, the point being is that hydrogen and helium are types of atoms, they're elements, something we'll return to in just a couple minutes, and they were the only types of atoms that are the most ancient. Now, since then, stars have been producing other types of atoms, and many of those are also very, very ancient. They come from stars that existed billions of years ago. All of the atoms that exist on Earth previously were in the cores of giant stars billions of years ago, okay? And those include atoms like carbon, hydrogen, um, I, well, hydrogen can, could come from the primordial universe, but oxygen, certainly, nitrogen, all these important elements, okay? Now, interesting thing about atoms, unrelated to them being so ancient, is they're mostly empty space. So, you know, just to kind of quickly, you know, kind of touch on that idea, let's assume that we have the positively charged nucleus of an atom. We've talked about the positive charge nucleus of an atom because we had to talk about that when we talked about electrostatics, the, the force between charges, such as a proton and an electron. And if I had that as a positive charge, an electron might be out here. It'd be so small, it'd be much smaller than the dot that I just drew. That would have a negative charge. And in between is nothing, just empty space. You have a little bit of matter clustered in the, cent cent the center of an atom. You've got the electrons forming a cloud of sorts outside of that center and everything in between just empty, okay? Now you might be like, well, how can almost empty space hold things together? How can that make something solid like lead or gold? Well, 
it's because of the electrostatic force primarily okay that's what pushes atoms against other atoms and that's what that's where matter comes from and volume and the fact that a chunk of something is is hard or takes up space is because of the electrostatic fate, um, force it's not because atoms themselves are dense they are not dense they are incredibly low density okay now elements heavier than hydrogen and much of the helium were produced in the interiors of stars as i said okay now there was some helium to start out with the big bang did produce some helium okay but all the heavier elements, even things just like, you know, oxygen, carbon, they all came from stars. Okay, so which of the following are incorrect statements about the atom? Okay, this is a good kind of starting point. Let's think about what do we know about the atom? What are our expectations? So A, atoms have been around since the beginning of the universe. B, atoms are mostly empty space. C, atoms are perpetually moving. Or D, atoms are manufactured in plants and in humans during pregnancy. Okay, so do plants and, and humans make atoms in other words? So what do you think? Okay, so we can basically definitely say that A and B are correct statements. So if we're looking for an incorrect statement, then we need to look at C or D. Okay, so which of those is incorrect? You got your, your, your feeling here, what you think is right? It's D, all right? So we can make new molecules, we can mix together atoms to make, you know, because obviously new cells are being produced, there are constantly processes, processes in biology, plants and humans included, that include creating new molecules, combining new molecules together. Okay, creating new proteins, for example. Now, that is not actually creating atoms. It's just moving around existing atoms. Atoms are only created through fission and fusion and other types of transmutation, which are all high energy events, which have nothing to do with biology. No part of biology involves the creation nor destruction of atoms. Not to say that's impossible. You know, the fission nuclear power plant does produce different types of atoms, or you know, it changes one atom into another, as do stars, okay? And in fact, in the next chapter, we'll talk more about the nucleus and, pro and the nuclear processes of fusion and fission, okay? But doesn't happen in biology. Okay, so that's the definition of the atom out of the way. What's an element? Because atom and element are closely related. These are terms that are very, very interconnected. How do we distinguish one from another? Well, an element is a material made up of only one kind of atom. Right there we see, that's that definition of an element, which is defined based on an atom, we see what the, what is the difference. So an atom is actually a single piece of an element. An element, a pure element, is just all of one type of atom. So elemental hydrogen would only have hydrogen. Now if I mix things together, like air, for example, is a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen and other gases, okay? So that is not an element, okay? Pure gold is an example, as it is made of only gold atoms. But if you mix gold, like rose gold, with other elements, then you have an alloy, for example, as a term. We'll talk about that a bit um, in later chapters. But the point is that you, then it is no longer a pure element. And certainly that gets well into the, the region and the, the, the field of chemistry. But, you know, again, later chapters. Okay? So atom is the fundamental unit of an element. Get it? Right? You break it down. You can't break it down any ore and still have that element. Now, you can break that atom into its electrons, protons, and neutrons, but those wouldn't be elements anymore. Those then are just particles. Okay? So the term element is used when referring to macroscopic quantities. The term atom is used when discussing the submicroscopic. Okay? So you can have a big chunk, maybe one gram of an element, but the actual size of the you know the building the building blocks individual atoms is something on the 10 to the negative 27 kilograms okay so tiny 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 amount of something for just a single atom okay so atoms make up all matter around us nothing around us is composed of anything other than atoms now there are unusual particles like um, neutrinos for example that aren't part of atoms that pass through earth that are produced from the sun so you can say, okay, yes, there are, strictly speaking, in the universe as a whole, things that aren't atoms, but everything in the typical world, the everyday world, Earth, the terrestrial world, the mundane world, that's all atoms, okay? To date, 115 distinct atoms have been created or discovered, okay? And 90 are found in nature. The, remain, the remainder are all synth synthesized, which is to say they're created in high-energy labs here on Earth. Um, basically since the, the late 1960s, that's when kind of the, the, this field of chemistry slash, slash physics and uh, creating these heavier elements started. Um, it's been primarily done in the United States and Russia, um, but they're all unstable because they're so big, they will quickly become radioactive and decay there. They are inherently radioactive and they will decay into lighter atoms, 
which is to say a lighter element, okay? Whatever small sample is created in the particular experiment. All right, they're all unstable, all the, all the heavier ones beyond the 90th um, element. That's the 90th element in the periodic table. We'll show, we'll show that in just a second. And again, an element is any material consisting of only one type of atom. Okay, so atoms are made up of protons and neutrons and electrons. Let's talk about protons and neutrons right now. So a proton, as we know, back when we talked about our electrostatics and electricity chapters, carries a positive charge and it has the same quantity of charge as an electron, which is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. That's how much charge is carried by an individual proton, exactly balanced with the charge of an electron. Now, don't think that they're identical otherwise. The proton is about 1,200 times more massive than the, than the electron, but they do carry the same charge, okay? All right, it's about oh, 1,800 times as massive, okay, as the electron. I don't know why I was thinking 1,200, but the point being it's a lot more massive, even though it's the same charge, okay? Protons have the same number of protons in the nucleus as electrons surrounding the nucleus of an electrically neutral atom. And unless we're talking about a charged atom, which is an ion, then this is what we always assume, okay? This is the, the I'll call this the baseline assumption. So if we talk about an atom, if anyone says, oh, there's an atom of this, you assume it's neutral and less told otherwise, okay? Which means there has to be the same number of protons as electrons. When we talk about ions and ions in chemistry and ionic, ba ionic bonds in later chapters, then we'll certainly talk about missing or extra electrons, okay? But not for now, okay? Electrons are identical to each other. All right, all electrons are the same. There's no, there's no different types of electrons. Same thing for protons, by the way. They repel electrons of neighboring atoms. So every atom is inherently repelled by other atoms, which begs the question, how do heck, how do, heck do atoms stick together and form molecules? But we'll get to that later. They have electrical repulsion that prevents atomic closeness. Okay, so atomic atoms want to be spaced away from each other. And that, that very much ties back in with that idea of volume, all right? Because if it wasn't for that electrical repulsion, then everything would be a lot smaller in the universe because everything would collapse down to a point if there was maybe much less electrical repulsion where all the atoms would be much closer together to, relative to each other and then matter would look very different. We probably still have matter in this hypothetical alternate universe, but everything would be denser and much, much smaller, okay? So now some very important things for understanding how we sort atoms. Okay, so I will say this, I'll say sort elements slash atoms, because this is such a big part of starting to understand this topic, you know, and, and make this bridge over to chemistry and understand the basics of chemistry. And that's these terms like atomic number, neutron number, and so on, okay? So atomic number is the number of protons, okay? That, that, that's the simple definition right there. It just tells you how many protons are in a particular element or one piece of that element, which of course is an atom. And that's how it's listed in the periodic table, okay? Now a neutron are also close to the protons. They're also in the nucleus, okay? And we'll talk about the nucleus more in the next chapter, but regardless, they accompany protons in the nucleus, okay? So they're, they're kind of packed right in with the protons. Again, to kind of draw a picture, if I was to zoom in on this nucleus, the center of an atom, an atom that's mostly dead space, and I draw a couple little protons, individual protons, then I'm also gonna put in two neutrons. I'll just put an N on those to represent that they're neutrons. And again, the electron would be a tiny little dot somewhere out here, okay? So that's the idea, is the neutrons are packed in together with the protons. They don't carry any charge at all, but they have a mass that's really, really similar to that of the proton, but it turns out they're actually slightly more massive than the proton, okay? All right, so they have about the same mass, but they're a little bit more massive. And it turns out the little bit more massive they are is about one more electron more massive, which is has to do with something called the weak nuclear force, which honestly we won't cover at all in this, this course. So don't worry about it, okay? So both protons and neutrons are called nucleons. And that trips some people up because the word neutron and nucleon are so close to each other. So make sure that you get used to distinguishing between those two terms, okay? Now, really neat thing about atoms is that atoms exist as in many categories called isotopes. And that's within an individual element. So if I look at an element like hydrogen or oxygen, because those are elements, okay, then there can be different isotopes of that element. What does that mean? What does it mean to be an isotope? 
what refers to the atoms of the same element that contain the same number of protons, because that's what defines an element, got that? The element is defined by the number of protons, okay? But different numbers of neutrons, okay? So you can have, for example, helium, okay? Helium has two protons, okay? Now you could have helium with just an individual neutron, just one neutron, okay? So that, that right there would be helium three because it has a total number of nucleons of three. On the other hand, more common type of helium has two neutrons, which balances the number of protons. And that's common for lighter elements like helium. It turns out for heavier elements, you end up having excess of neutrons. But for a light element like helium, you would have more, more common, have a balance of two and two, that is two neutrons and two protons, and that would be called helium four. Okay? Now, both of those are isotopes of helium. Now, the most common type, the type here, like helium-4, that's usually called just plain old helium. We, we'd rarely call that an isotope, but technically any, any type of an element is an isotope. But it's usually the rarer ones, the ones that, that only exist in some tiny fraction of the population of that element, that those are the ones that are referred to as the isotopes. Isotopes are often unstable, they're often radioactive, and they're often only produced in small quantities during certain um, processes, okay? All right. Now, isotopes are defined by the mass number. We haven't talked about the mass number yet, but the mass number is simply the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And we'll, we'll circle back around it at the bottom of this slide. Okay? So mass number is the total number of protons and neutrons. In other words, the total number of, yep, nucleons. Okay? Now, again, isotopes differ only in mass and not by electric charge because every isotope of a certain element has the same number of protons because that's, what's, that's what defines that element after all. Therefore, isotopes share many characteristics, okay? Okay, so how, how, do they, how do they differ then? Well, they can differ in terms of their density, they can differ in terms of the way they can interact in terms of nuclear processes. So there are some important, important quantities, okay? Important things to consider. For example, there's something called heavy water, which involves having um, having a heavy version of hydrogen in an H2O molecule, and that's important in nuclear reactors. So, you know, that's part of the story of these ideas of isotopes. But there's many, many examples of isotopes having applications, for example. So the total number of neutrons, which would be like the N number, all right, in an isotope is the mass number minus the atomic number, okay? Okay, all right, let's move on. So atomic mass, what is that? Well, it's kind of like a unit, and it's a way to kind of just quickly think about how many nucleons there are in a particular element. It is the total mass of atoms, that's protons, neutrons, and electrons, but of course electrons add very little to the total mass. And it's what's listed in the periodic table as atomic mass unit, okay? So one atomic mass unit is, since it's a mass, is equivalent to a certain number of kilograms. And here we see it's equivalent to that many kilograms, 1.661 times 10 to the negative 27, so very small number, kilograms, okay? So essentially it's 10 to the negative 27, so you can think of that as a, a thousandth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a kilogram, okay? So the atomic number of an element matches the number of what? Right, because so far we talked about you know, the neutron number, the mass number, and the atomic number. So which one was the atomic number? Was it the number of protons in the nucleus? Was it the number of electrons in a neutral atom? Was it both, or was it neither of these? Well, it turns out it's both, okay? Because in a neutral atom, the number of protons has to equal the number of electrons. So when you're given that atomic number, and you'll see in the periodic table, when you show, show the slide of the periodic table, then that actually, you can read that number and say, oh, that's the number of protons and the number of electrons, okay? All right, so the nucleus with an atomic number of 44 and a mass number of 100 must have 44 neutrons, 56 neutrons, 100 neutrons, or none of the above. Now remember that we're using our relationship here between number of neutrons, atomic number, and mass number, okay? And remember the equation that we presented just a couple of slides ago. The number of neutrons is going to equal the mass number minus the number of protons, okay, which we'll call A. All right, so with that, that probably helps. It's 56, it's just 100 minus 44, okay? Excellent. So finally, I've hinted at it a lot. It's you know, something I keep saying we're gonna lead up to, and that's none other than the periodic table. What is the periodic table? Well, it's this, it's this guide, it's a map to understanding 
all those building blocks of elements, how they're so important to chemistry, how they, you know, how they interact, a lot, a lot to unpack here. But I think the way we should look at the periodic table so far is just look for that information that we presented, the mass number and the atomic number, right? And see how that's listed on the periodic table, okay? All right, so it's a list of all the known elements, including those ones that are unstable and created in labs, all right? It is not something to be memorized. It's a reference, okay? Don't try to memorize the periodic table. You know, me memorize the difference between the nucleon and the neutron, sure, but don't memorize the periodic table. It's just not necessary, okay? Instead, we learn how to read it, okay? Interpreting information like the mass number and the, pro and the um, atomic number. A chemist uses the periodic table much like a writer uses a dictionary, okay? All right, here it is, the periodic table. And this one has some, some example pictures, like elements like mercury, silver, um, titanium. Here we have um, carbon, okay? Helium in balloons. Here we have silicon, okay, so important for circuits. Zinc, an, exa a, uh, an example of a metal. And bromine, okay, which is a very, a very um, easily produced gas, okay? Nearly what's called a noble gas, but we'll talk more about noble gases later. All right, but all of, all those examples aside, and little you know pictures and stories about them, all of those fit into this overall periodic ta periodic table. And here it is. Okay, now the periodic table is presented this way with these kind of these peaks on the sides over here, um, just in just in terms of like sorting. And that there's some different versions of this, but this is by far the most common. And there's even a kind of a, a zoom in here. So you notice when you go from element 57 to 72 that you have to follow this here to say that. This, this whole, these whole two rows actually squeeze in there. So you can see 58 through 71 squeeze into that space as is implied by the graphic, okay? All right. Um, the lighter elements are at the top. The lightest element by far is hydrogen over here, right? Next is helium. So we read just like we would read um, a book. We read from, from the top, starting on the left, the left to right, okay? Um, and then as we keep going, we go all the way through all the elements. Here we're just seeing their their names represented by letters. These are their shorthand names. So you, you have to you know, be able to sort of translate these, but you can quickly look that up. We already know, for example, on the few of the pictures that are showing that ZN is short for zinc, TI is, is short for titanium, and so on, okay? HG for mercury, all right? Okay, so lots of, lots of good examples here of seeing the elements on the periodic table. Notice that this particular version of the periodic table only shows what number? What's that number that's showing? Okay, you can see it throughout throughout the periodic table. What's that one number that's showing? Is it the atomic number or is it the mass number? It's the atomic number, it's the number of protons. The mass number is not showing, okay? Not in this version of the periodic table, okay? So the elements are highly organized within the periodic table. So elements that are close to each other on the periodic table have similar behavior when they are, say, you know, heated or when they, um, when they interact with an electrical charge, um, they have similar behavior in terms of the way that they create molecules or don't create molecules and so on, okay? So each vertical column is called a group, all right? Each horizontal row is called a period, just like the name, okay? So here we can see examples of groups, 18 of them, and periods all the way down to seven, only seven. Okay, because there's the two subsets that squeeze in because the sixth and seventh period are much longer than the other ones. Okay, okay. Here we're looking at how the groups and the periods reflect the atomic size. Okay, now here, when we're looking here at these, these are indeed the atomic size. We can see hydrogen and helium are examples of small atoms. And then we can see that the atoms don't get strictly bigger as we go up, right? Indeed, it seems like the biggest atoms tend to be those over in the group one, they're all a little bit bigger. They, they get progressively bigger as we go down periods, but they're bigger than the ones on the other, the other side with a little bit of a peak here in the middle, all right? And then kind of continuing back on. So that has to do with lots of, lots of factors of how the electrons stack themselves. Because as we get more and more electrons outside of a nucleus, those electrons end up filling up energy levels in very particular ways. Okay, and those particular ways that the energy levels get filled up, that equates to the size of the atom. Okay, and another way we can group together the periodic table in a very broad sense, and this is quite useful, is to think of over in period one as the alkali metals. Okay, 
And indeed, those, those are metallic and include hydrogen. Now, you might think of hydrogen as a gas, and you'd be absolutely right to think of it, but under very high pressure, hydrogen can become a metal. And it's, it has enough metal-like behaviors that we say that's an alkali metal, as do other elements in that, in that um, group, okay, and that are in other periods other than period one for hydrogen. Then we have the alkaline earth metals, which is the next group. Then we have a very large group, or we have a very large class and includes multiple groups all the way from three to 12, which are the transition metals, okay? Now that includes everything that we think of as everyday metals, like silver and titanium and, and, um, and copper and so on, okay? All right, those are our basically transition metals. Then we have some that aren't easily grouped. There's no, there's no common name for these, these ones. Many of them are gaseous, some aren't, so kind of a, a mix there, okay? Then we get into the halogens, which are which are gases, and then finally the noble gases, which are called noble because they don't mix with other elements, and that's just because they have what's what's called a full electron cloud. There's no space for other electrons, which means they don't bond easily. Okay, all right, all right. Continuing on, looking at the periodic table, here we're zooming in on these inner transition metals, these ones that are you know, within that kind of classific classification of transition metals, but have special characteristics. And these are the lanthanids and the actinids. And we can see that these are pretty dramatic elements. These are ones that um, aren't, aren't usually everyday elements and include some of the, the, most, um, the most important elements out there in terms of energy sources like uranium, okay? Okay, so let's do a check here. Which is larger? a lithium atom or a fluorine atom. Think about the trend we saw there in terms of where atomic size, in what direction atomic size went. They're both in the same period, okay? So that means that we don't, that within that period, which one should be larger? Well, it's a lithium because as we go down in group number, we, we get larger in general, especially in a, a low number group like this or a low number period like this, okay? All right, which is larger, an arsenic atom or a sulfur atom? Okay, so here we can see we move, we move slightly over in, term, in terms of group number, or we decrease slightly in group number when we went from the sulfur to the arsenic, okay, in this direction. But more importantly, we drop down in terms of period. And what did we see was the trend as we, as we increased in period, right? And then drop down, I mean, actually down the page, but of course the number got bigger, right? We went, we went from, let's see, a one, two, so we went from the third period to the fourth period. So which one do you think should be bigger? Well, it's arsenic. Okay, because as you get on period, the size also increases, all right, as a trend. So the quick aside here, let's consider what's the difference between a physical and a conceptual model. So physical model replicates the object at a convenient scale, right? That's like, that's like building a model of a building to test it with forces, right? Put it on an earthquake table or something, okay? So that's the idea of a physical model. A conceptual model describes a system. It sort of boils, boils a system down to just a few characteristics and thinks about what are the governing equations that would fit those boiled down characteristics. So an atom is best described by a conceptual model because if we build a physical model of an atom, it's not gonna behave the same. It just can't. The physics that govern things at the macroscopic scale, because that's what we'd be doing. If we built a physical model, we'd build it sort of fit on a tabletop, right? Maybe we'd build it as a, a ball spinning around a center of some sort. Well, how would you do that? How, what force would you use? Would you use a magnetic force? Well, then you've changed the physics. It doesn't work. You can't build a physical model of an atom. You could say maybe just the, the, the scale is just too different. You can build a physical model of a building because it's only, say, a thousand times smaller, okay? But you can't build a physical model of an atom. Just like you can't build a physical model of a black hole because there's no way to recreate the physics of a black hole at a smaller scale, okay? So instead, we only have conceptual models for them, all right? So that is limiting, it is, that we can't build a physical model of an atom. But it also is an incredibly interesting idea that as humans, with our human minds, the only way we can think about atoms is to conceptualize them, to say, okay, what, what thought process can we use and what math within that thought process can we use to understand the atom, okay? So another quick aside, let's talk about how we identify atoms because we've talked a lot about the, about the periodic table Certainly you could imagine, and I hinted at the fact that it's been studied 
you know, for generations, you know, since, you know, about certain, you know, I, the heavier elements being created since the 1960s, but even before that, the periodic table predates. And, you know, there's been so much history of studying it, right? So, so much, so many people's life, life's work has gone into that periodic table. But one thing is how do we identify individual atoms? What, what's the, what's one way we do that? Well, we use a spectroscope. Okay. That's what scientists would use to actually say, okay, well, it's this atom instead of this other atom. Okay. It's an instrument that separates and spreads light into its component frequencies. It allows the analysis of light emitted by elements when they are made to glow, identifying each element by its characteristic pattern. In other words, each element emits a distinctive glow when energized and displays a distinctive spectrum. Think of it like the elemental fingerprint. Okay? Fingerprint. Now, we can distinguish between isotopes by, by using things like um, finding out their mass by, by accelerating them through, through some ma uh, magnetic field. So that's a bit different. But if, we're not, if we don't have to worry about isotopes, if we just want to worry about distinguishing elements, then we can use this idea of their light pattern. Because it turns out that their energy levels of electrons produce particular lights. Okay, light frequencies. Why is that? Well, we talked about how light and transparency and atoms getting excited all fit together. Please review pre previous chapters if it doesn't sound familiar. We've absolutely discussed that. We talk talked about an idea of glass being transparent and the atoms in a, a you know three atom thick piece of glass absorbing absorbing electrons, spinning the electron back out, reabsorbing it, spinning it back out. Well, that's happening at particular energy levels, and that energy level tells you what that glass is made of. Okay. And that's the idea of a spectroscope. Okay, so let's talk more about the atomic spectrum. It's an element's fingerprint, as I said. A pattern of discrete, discrete is just sort of scientific jargon for distinct, frequencies of light. Okay, so the discoveries of the atomic spectrum of hydrogen came first. It was the first element where spectrum was discovered because it turns out it has a, a spectrum that's partially in the visible part of the of the you know of the whole electromagnetic spectrum. And it, you know, and hydrogen is pretty easy to isolate. It's very abundant. And so it was scientists um, way back in the 1800s that first discovered that particular spectrum. Since then, we've discovered spectrums for lots of other elements, basically all of them, even spectrums for complicated elements like uranium, although those are pretty tough to, pretty tough to analyze, but certainly, you know, oxygen and nitrogen and other elements. Okay. So a, a researcher in the 1800s noted that hydrogen has a more orderly atomic spectrum than others. Okay, and again, that's because it was because the hydrogen gas was truly atomic. Other gases were a mix. All right, and also because it's it, there's less energy levels. So even like pure nitrogen, for example, would have a a more difficult spectrum to analyze, especially with the techniques of the 1800s. And then jo Johann Balmer, who's there's the Balmer series, that's who this these first um, atomic spectrums are named after, expressed the line positions by a mathematical formula. You have a conceptual model, don't you? Johannes Rydberg noted that the sum of the frequencies of two lines often equals the frequency of a third line. And that's because of the actual electron excitation levels and electrons either skipping a level or taking individual steps. Uh -huh. Okay. So let's take a look. Yeah, I know this is an abstract idea. So let's look at some actual spectral lines that you could, you could see in the lab. Okay. You, you could go to a, any college, college physics lab and they would have some setup to look at these lines. Usually there is a discharge tube. In this case, we see we're actually kind of burning an element by putting it inside of a flame, but often there's an electrical current that's ran through a, a, a tube that holds a particular elemental gas. And as that current runs through the tube, it excites the atoms. As atoms become excited, they emit light. You can, you can see just by looking at them that they glow different colors. So you can see, you know, one is yellow, the other is green and so on. And then you take that, what the color that you see with your eyes is your eyes don't distinguish individual frequencies, right? Your eyes to show you the color, which is the sum of different frequencies. But then you can have it shine through particular types of special glasses or what's called, again, a, um, a prism, or you can use a diffraction grating to split that light up. But the point is you're taking that light and you're splitting it into its frequencies, just like you take white light and you split it into a rainbow. But in this case, you're taking, say, green light and splitting it just into the frequency that make the green light. For when the green light coming from copper, well, that green is made by yellow, a lot of green, and a little bit of blue. So that's actually what makes the green. And those particular frequencies are absolutely well-defined. We know exactly what they are, all right? So this is a special or specific frequency and thus wavelength, because we know that the speed of light gives us the frequency times the wavelength. So if you know one, you know the other, okay? 
Now here, we think of color maybe more as being wavelength. So we could say, okay, well, that is a particular wavelength of light. And these are all visible lights, by the way, which is why we showed blue, the blue, the yellow, and the red, and so on, okay? Um, strontium has its own particular set of frequencies, and they're, they're defined as lines. We call these emission lines, which is a good name for them, right? Because they look like lines in these pictures, emission lines, okay? But it's also called the emission spectrum. Okay, excellent. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, now that idea comes from atomic excitation. Again, we've talked about this before, but we're reviewing it here. Okay, so you have some nucleus, for example, here, this particular nucleus has four protons and some more, and a uh, five, uh, yeah, five neutrons in it, see? All right, and there's some electron not drawn to scale outside. We have energy coming in as light right here, all right? That energy comes in, that light energy gets imparted to the electron because energy can't be created nor destroyed. That then gives the electron more potential energy, which allows it to move further away from the nucleus, which means it can move up to a higher energy level. But it turns out that, that it can't just move up to any higher energy level. It has to take a particular step. This is called the quantum step. Okay, we'll come back to that idea. But this is, this is what we mean by things being quantum. All right? They, it means they come in steps. The electron cannot go somewhere in between. It can't. It is physically impossible. Okay? But that energy of the electron in this excited higher potential energy state won't last forever. Eventually, the electron is going to relax. We often say that's the term for it. The electron then, then returns to a lower energy level, which is closer to the nucleus, because the electron wants to be attracted to the nucleus. After all, it has negative charge, right? So the electron wants to get close to the nucleus. So when it gets closer to the nucleus, that means it releases energy, and then energy then comes out as light. That's the light that we see in the emission spectrum. Okay, we excited the atom. When the atom relaxed in a middle light, we can see that light. Okay, good. So... Each spectral line in an atomic spectrum represents what? A specific frequency of light emitted by an element, one of the many colors of an element, or a pattern characteristic of the element? Or are they, are they all true? Which is it? Each spectral line. Well, the spectral line is just the specific frequency, okay? We call the spectrum, or the spectrograph, all of the lines. But the line itself is just one frequency, which is also to say one wavelength. Okay, and remember again, the letter for wavelength is lambda, which is a Greek letter. Okay, so the hydrogen spectrum consists of many spectral lines. How can this simple element have so many lines? What's the best explanation here? One electron can be boosted to many different energy levels. The electron can move at a variety of speeds. The electron can vibrate at a variety of frequencies. Or the many standing electron waves can fit in the shell of the hydrogen atom. So which is it? It's the fact that one electron can be boosted to many different energy levels. Okay, so every atom, even an atom that just has one electron, can, like hydrogen, can have that electron occupy many different energy levels. Thus, there are many different lines that that one element can produce. Okay, it's just like a staircase has many steps, not just one. Same idea here. The energy levels, there's lots of them. They're not evenly spaced like steps on a staircase, but there's some very badly made staircase with uneven steps. But the point is that there's lots of different available steps. The electron, the electron can jump to those different steps depending on how much energy is given to the atom, okay? So when an atom is excited, its electrons are boosted to higher energy levels, the atoms are charged with light energy, the atoms are made to shake, rattle, and roll, or do none of these apply? I bet you know which one it is. It's that idea of being boosted to a higher energy level. You got, it's, like the, it's like the electron is kicked up to a higher energy level. And higher, higher energy levels are always further from the nucleus, okay? So the frequencies of light emitted by an atom often add up to a higher frequency of light emitted by the same atom or a lower frequency of light emitted by the same atom or both or none, which is it? A higher frequency of light, okay? Because this is the idea that you could have some energy level, you call this energy level one, and you got some higher energy level, energy level two, and I'm drawing these kind of circles to imagine that these are like circles around the nucleus. And then let's imagine energy level three up here. Well, you can have your electron, Here's our electron. Well, our electron could jump all the way from one to three. Because again, it, it can't go anywhere between energy levels, but it can skip an energy level. Well, here's the thing. When it jumps to one to three, maybe when it relaxes, it relaxes down to two, and then subsequently it relaxes from two to one. Well, now we see how these frequencies would sum up, we call these F1 and F2, they would sum up to F3. So F1 plus F2 would equal F3. Okay? Good. So the quantum hypothesis. What is it? Okay. So 
what does that term quantum? What does it mean? What is it? What like what's the what's the baseline meaning of it? Well, it turns out turns out that a quantum is a step. Okay, so really that's the way to think of it. Quantum is just a term that means step. So if something is quantized, then it comes in in particular chunks. So, for example, a bag of jelly beans is quantized because each jelly bean is one piece of the bag, right? A bag of water or a bucket of water is not quantized. It's continuous because it doesn't come in chunks. Now, ultimately, it turns out, of course, water does because if you zoom in on water, okay, it's particular molecules of H2O. And then, you know, but at the macroscopic scale, we would say that water appears to be continuous, not quantized, but clearly a bag of jelly beans is quantized. Well, that's what we're talking about here when we talk about the quantum hypothesis, that at the small scale, at the sub-microscopic sub scale of individual atoms, everything is quantized, okay? When you zoom in on the universe, it turns out that nothing is continuous. Everything comes in little pieces. And that's a crazy idea. And it was an idea that was presented in the 20th century, in the early 1900s, okay? But as far as we can tell, in physics and chemistry, it's true, okay? So Max Planck, a German physicist hypothesized, starting with warm bodies, that they emit radiant energy in discrete, and discrete means quantized chunks, all right, discrete bundles, here bundles, just the, the term the book is using, I'm, I'm saying chunk, bundles the same, and we call those quanta, okay? So little pieces of something, tiny, tiny submicroscopic pieces. The energy in each energy bundle is proportional to the frequency of radiation. Okay? And this is, this is back when we talked about that idea of Wien's Law and black body radiation and how if you know the temperature of something, you know what color it should glow at. So that, that, that's all kind of consequences of this, these early experiments by Max, Max Planck. What's so interesting historically is Max Planck thought that this was just a mathematical convenience and sort of a stopgap solution. He didn't think it was the true physics of, of the, of the, micro, the submicroscopic world. But subsequent scientists, including Max Planck himself, came to accept that indeed quantum mechanics is real. All right. Einstein was a bit of a holdout, but even later in life, he, he somewhat accepted quantum mechanics as well. All right. So Einstein stated that light itself is quantized. A beam of light is not a continuous stream of energy, but consists of countless small discrete quanta, little chunks, light. Right. And we call those quantum chunks of light photons. That's the particle of light. And by the way, that term particle and the quantum hypothesis are very interconnected. Because particle physics, the study of all the little small pieces that make everything in the universe, is a, is a quantum physics type of study. Because it's the idea that everything is broke into particles. Particle is a tiny bundle of energy, a tiny chunk. Okay, So is light a wave or is it a stream of particles? Because we've certainly talked about light being a wave. We talked about you know, so much about how we had, to, we had to discuss waves. We had a whole chapter on waves and that helped us understand light because both light and sound are waves, remember? Well, sound is definitely a wave. Sound is not a particle, right? Clearly, it's just, it is just, it's just a mechanical wave. But what is light? Well, it turns out light is both, okay? Light can be described by both models, both conceptual models. They both work, okay? So it exhibits, it exhibits properties of both a wave and a particle depending on the experiment. So sometimes it's distinctly a wave. In other experiments, it's distinctly a particle. So light is both. It just, it just shows that sort of the limitation of our mind of saying, applying macroscopic ideas like, like ocean waves or sound waves to something like light, right? So, there, so maybe there's, you know, what word do we use? We can call it a wavelet, for example. You can say wavelet. So kind of a new made up word that applies to light. Or just accept that, that our, our language isn't, isn't perfect for discussing light. And we have to th therefore have this duality and say that light is both a wave and a particle because it truly is, okay? So the amount of energy in a photon is directly proportional to the frequency of light, which is so interesting because the frequency, that's a wave property, but energy per photon, that's a particle property. So they are interconnected. Mathematically, we can show that they're absolutely, the energy of a particle is directly proportional to the frequency of the wave. Amazing stuff, okay? So in that relationship, the proportionality between energy per photon, particle of light, to the frequency of that particular type of light, the symbol F stands for the frequency of emitted light, of emitted light and E stands for, what I already told you, the energy of the photon, okay? So which of these has the greatest energy per photon, okay? So this is, this is very much a review question. Red light, green light, blue light, or do they all have the same energy per photon? Which is it? Remember, 
Think about the wavelength. Which of these has the longest wavelength? Okay, it's red light. Well, if red light has the longest wavelength, then it has the lowest frequency, which means that blue light, which has the longest wavelength, so a long wavelength, excuse me, short, must have a high frequency, okay? Just like red light, which we know has a long wavelength, therefore must have a low frequency. Well, that means that light that has long wavelength, like red light, or even longer wavelength, infrared light, those all have low frequencies. And frequency is directly proportional to energy per photon. So then we know that the energy per photon is low for red light, and it's high for blue light. All right? No, I keep writing the wrong word. High for blue light. Okay? So it means blue light is higher energy light. And that makes sense because, remember, it's ultraviolet light that we're worried about burning our skin. We don't worry about infrared light burning our skin because infrared light is low energy light. Radio waves are long wavelength, high frequency, all right? Or, um, um, sorry, excuse me, long wavelength, low frequency, low energy. That's radio waves, even microwaves, okay? High energy is UV. X-rays are even higher energy because they're even higher frequency. That's why X-rays are so harmful. So then the answer is blue light, okay? The shorter wavelength light is the higher energy light. Short wavelength means high energy, okay? And that high energy per photon has real world consequences, right? It damages things, it burns your skin, it causes um, you know, your cells to break down, okay? So which of these photons has the smallest energy? Infrared, visible, or ultraviolet? Make sure you can answer this. R review the electromagnetic spectrum if you need to to remember where infrared is located. But the answer is infrared, which I suppose I gave away with my hint there, okay? So it's infrared light. All right, so using the quantum hypothesis, Danish, Danish physicist Niels Bohr explained the formation of the atomic spectrum. So this is kind of interesting, because historically speaking, you had the spectrum, like the Balmer series, and then you had concurrently physicists like Max Planck coming up with the idea of quantized energy bundles. Well, Niels Bohr came, brought those ideas together. Right, because those were those were separate ideas within the scientific scientific community. But Niels Bohr brought them together, got a Nobel Prize Nobel Prize for it in physics. Point being is he came up with a very good conceptual model for hydrogen. Now it turns out that the Bohr model, as we call it, doesn't work for other atoms because it has some serious in, inaccuracies in it. But it was a wonderful starting point, and we still use it today because it does work so well for hydrogen, and it's so much simpler than other models like. These ones that use something called the Schrodinger equation that would also that would more accurately apply or describe the hydrogen model. We don't need those because the Bohr model works so well. Okay, a conceptual model. So the potential energy of an electron depends on its distance from the nucleus. Okay, those are those steps away from the nucleus. When an atom absorbs a photon of light, it absorbs energy. Then a low potential energy electron is boosted to become a high potential energy electron. These are the same ideas I was describing a few slides back with the picture of the energy levels of the electron. Indeed, we're gonna show that again. So using the quantum hypothesis, when an electron in any energy level drops closer to the nucleus, it emits a photon of light because it lost potential energy, therefore that light, that energy be, that becomes light energy. And there you go, you got a particular amount of light energy being emitted, which, apply, which corresponds to a particular color of light, wavelength, okay? Bohr reasoned that there must be a number of distinct, quantized, energy levels within the atom. Each energy level has a principal quantum number called n, where n is always an integer, because you can't have a half step, okay? The lowest level is n equals one. That's the one closest to the nucleus. And, the, and the, again, the atom, can, the atom cannot exist with the electron any closer, okay? Electrons release energy in discrete amounts that form discrete lines in the atom spectrum. And by the way, any model of the atom that didn't accept this idea of discrete energy steps didn't work. It didn't work because of electromagnetic induction and the fact that the, the electron would just spiral inward and crash into the nucleus. But that obviously doesn't happen. Atoms are stable. The electrons don't spiral inwards and crash, crash into the nucleus, nucleus composed of nucleons, protons, and neutrons. No, atoms are stable, okay? So that's why we needed this model. And that's why Niels, the Niels Bohr model was such a big deal back in the early 1900s, okay? So which of the following is a quantum number? I just said quantum numbers have to be integers. Which of these is an integer, okay? Well, it's two, okay? They're only integers, okay? So the Bohr's model 
or Bohr's model, explains why atoms don't collapse. Okay? Electrons can lose only specific amounts of energy equivalent to the transition between those levels. There's no way to go below that n equals 1 level. An atom reaches the lowest energy level, called the ground state, appropriately, right? because it can't go below it. Right? Now, of course, you can dig into the ground, but you can't dig into an atomic ground state, where the electron can't lose more energy. It can't move closer to the nucleus. There's no way for it to, okay? which is so different because that, that's not part of electrostatics. Because again, electrostatics, this idea like the Coulomb force, again, review, uh, review the Coulomb force if you don't remember it, but the Coulomb force says that electrons and protons are attracted to each other. They should just get pulled inwards, okay? But that doesn't happen, okay? And that means that, the, that we can come up with a planetary model of the atom, but a little different than real platinum. Real, real planets, because a planet can exist any distance from any distance from a star. Of course, if it's too close, the star would probably melt it. But the point being, there's there's no closest distance to a star. But in this kind of mix between the planetary model and the atomic model, we 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 deal with this idea of the quantum hypothesis. Okay, and it says that photons are emitted by atoms as electrons move from higher energy outer levels to lower energy inner levels. Because remember, a lower level is less potential because the electron wants to be close to the nucleus. The energy of an emitted photon is equal to the difference in the energy between the two levels. Because an electron is restricted to those discrete quantized levels, only light of distinct frequencies is emitted. That's why you have those spectrograms, why you have those spectral pictures of particular lines, emission lines. Okay. So an electron's wave nature explains why electrons in an atom are restricted to those particular, particular energy levels. That's what's called an electron wave. Now you'd be like, wait, we talked about light being a particle and a wave, the photon versus the wave. Are electrons also particle waves? Yes. In fact, every bit, bit of matter is a particle wave, okay? But it's more obvious with very small particles like electrons. And so we see that actually what the electrons are doing is they're creating standing waves, just like standing waves in a string with nodes and antinodes and certain numbers of those harmonics. Well, that's the same idea of energy levels. So an electron's wave nature explains why an electron in an atom is restricted to particular energy levels. The permitted energy levels are a natural consequence of the standing electron wave closing in on themselves, completing a circle in a synchronized matter. In other words, N equals one, the lowest possible energy state of an electron in an atom, consists of a single wavelength. N equals two, two wavelengths, and so on, just like standing waves on a string. Indeed, we can draw a little picture of that, right? So if we imagine vibrating a wire loop of fixed circumference, we can come up with an integer number of standing waves, right? So we could have a case where there's just one, we, we, you know, the loop isn't vibrating, we start it vibrating, and we can come up with a standing wave that fits like this, right? Note that these are nodes, the same terminology we use for standing waves. In this case, we're seeing, I guess it looks like we're seeing maybe based on the perspective here, two full wavelengths. It looks like one full wavelength there and another one here, but it's just a little lopsided because of the way the loop is situated. Regardless, it's a stable standing wave. In other words, these locations of nodes would not move. It would continue to vibrate like that. Okay, that's a mechanical vibration. But that analogy, that conceptual, in this case, sort of a physical model, but or maybe just a more physical demonstration to get the idea across, holds true for electrons, okay? Electrons have this not mechanical vibration, but a quantized energy vibration where they fit one or multiple full wavelengths in an orbit, quote unquote, around the nucleus, okay? Composed of you know, protons and neutrons. Okay, and you can't have a case where that synchronized wave does not close in on itself. That would not be possible. That's why only discrete energy levels exist, because you have to get to a point where you can fit a full other wavelength. Otherwise, you have a destructive occurrence of waves and what, some sort of unstable energy state that isn't possible. See, and that's what's being shown here in this picture here. This is an, an uh, energy state that would not be allowed because there's not an integer number of wavelengths that fit on the circumference of the circle, okay? All right, so that gives us particular energy levels. And we call those energy levels sometimes shells, especially physicists call them shells. Um, I guess chemists do too. And that gives us the shell model of the atom, okay? And that's the different energy levels of the atom. 
Now we'll talk more about energy levels of the atom a bit as we continue to get into chemistry, but hopefully this is a good foundation of thinking about what is what is going on going on inside the atom and what the quantum hypothesis is all about. Okay? So then the shell model shows the first three periods of the periodic table. So for example, hydrogen just you know has a particular shell, all right? That first shell can only hold two electrons. So we see then the helium, that shell is full. Helium's a noble gas. As we as we get into subsequent shells, those can hold more electrons. So we get into the next shell, the next higher energy level, we that would it has to be partially filled for lithium. We see there's one electron. For beryllium, there's two electrons in that next shell, the second shell. Boron has three, and finally carbon has four. As we continue on, nitrogen has five, oxygen six, fluorine seven, and finally that second shell is completely full of neon because that second shell holds eight. Remember the first shell only hold only held two. Okay? Now these are all electrons in their ground state. Now you could take, say, an electron and push it up to a higher energy state, and that'd be that would be much like pushing it to a higher shell, but here they're this is the case where you have multiple electrons filling as many spots as possible. Why are there only particular spots per shell? You know, what sets that rule? Well, it comes down to quantum mechanics and it comes down to these particular waves being able to exist and how many waves can exist in particular sets of conge like um, sort of um, these, these different formations. So think like three dimensional geometric formations of those shells. Okay, and those standing waves. Ultimately, that, that's what's going on, but here we want to think of it more as a way to conceptualize the atom. Okay, so that's enough now to introduce the atom. It, we're not done with it yet. We're certainly going to talk more about the nucleus in the next chapter and about the consequences of the atom throughout this whole chemistry unit. But regardless, I, I hope this has been interesting and enjoyable, and thank you so much for watching.